All right, thank you. Um, yes, as I said, uh, this is uh, our work on AES with the Secret S box. This is joint work with uh, Lars, Stefan, and Martin. Um, for the impatient, um, I will be starting by giving some motivation, uh, go into a little bit of background to integral crypt analysis, and then uh, I'll talk about our crypt analysis of uh, four rounds of AES with the Secret S box. In the paper, that there's a five and a six round extension. Um, they rely on the same methods as the four-round attack, so I will not refer to them here. All right. Um, so uh, why would anybody bother looking at uh, AES with the Secret S box? So there are two reasons for um, uh, application of this. So the first one, if we, w we might uh, consider increasing uh, the size of the secret to increase the security of the cipher. So by using a Secret S box, we increase the size of the secret by more than uh, 1,500 bits. Um, another, uh, another reason might be that we are legally obliged to use a secret cipher. So, so this could be maybe in a top secret setting or to get some certification. Uh, but maybe we lack the resources to develop our own cipher. Um, there are also the theoretical reasons to look at this, we believe. Um, uh, the main one being uh, to get some insight into the structural security of AES. So when we strip away the information that we have about the S-Box, what remains, how much of the security uh, still remains. Uh, and uh, another one is that we hope that this also the techniques that we, uh, that we are using here might have uh, some application in white box cryptography and uh, in scare attacks. So what is the setting that we are looking at? The target is uh, the standard AES. Um, where we uh, substitute the S-Box, so the Reindar S-Box, everywhere where it appears on the cipher with a secret S-Box. So an S-Box uh, of which we assume the adversary has absolutely no knowledge. And our goal is then to retrieve both the S-Box and the key. So the goal is not just to uh, find a decryption algorithm. This would, be, uh, uh, it would give us uh, probably different methods, but we actually want to uncover the, the, the S-Box itself. So I won't be talking about the AES at all. I assume you have this all lying on your uh, nightstand and know it by heart. Uh, so for those of you who don't know AES, I'm very sorry, but I'll continue here. Yeah. Um, probably the two, most, uh, two of the most powerful attacks are certainly differential and linear attacks. There has already been some work on random S-boxes, so if we choose a random 8-bit S-box, it's already very likely to have relatively good linear and differential um, properties. So the maximum differential probability and the maximum square correlation will be relatively low. We can additionally use some filtering to guarantee good differential linear properties. And when we combine this with a very strong diffusion of the AES, it seems to us very unlikely that good differential and dif linear attacks are possible. In any case, it, it seems to, uh, to be also quite hard to apply such an attack without uh, any knowledge about the S-Box. So for us, integral crypt analysis seems to be the, uh, the best shot at attacking the cipher. So what is the idea of uh, uh, integral cryptanalysis? In, uh, instead of looking at just one plain text or maybe a pair of plain text as in differential cryptanalysis, we look at a whole set of, plain t of text that uh, fulfills a given property, and then we trace how this property evolves, th uh, this property of the set evolves when the, while the, um, sets are, uh, the, the texts are moving through the cipher. So originally this attack was designed by uh, Lars Knudsen, uh, for the square uh, cipher, so it's called square attack, and has been successfully generalized by Lux uh, to saturation attacks and by Shamir and Biryukov to uh, SASAS structures. So uh, just standard square attack is, or scan standard integral attacks is, uh, are possible to break four to six rounds uh, of uh, uh, um, AES for any key size. And uh, to me, uh, what is interesting, it has been mentioned before today, I think, uh, that they can be viewed as a clever way of uh, calculating a higher order differential. So uh, a little bit of definition and notation. So uh, such an attack normally starts with a lambda set. A lambda set is a set of 256 messages um, that differ only in one byte. For the rest, they have all the same value, but in this one byte, they take all possible 256 values. Um, for the notation, we will be using the P property in a byte position to denote that each possible byte value appears in this position once. We will use the B property standing for balance to denote that all bytes sum up to zero. And we will use just a dot to denote that the bytes are constant and a question mark to denote that we don't know of any particular property at this position. Um, also for uh, 
the oral communication, I will be referring to the F256 as the Rheindahl field and uh, to uh, F2 to the 8 as the vector space. So don't be confused if I don't give any dimensions. Um, all right, so let's see how uh, such a lambda, uh, how uh, the operations of the AES um, change the properties that we just mentioned. So it is straightforward to see that uh, uh, the add round key operation and the shift rows operation don't have a, don't affect the properties. So we only have to look at, sub bytes, at the subbytes operation and at the mixed columns operation. So for the subbytes operation, um, if we have a, a, set, a set of text that has the p property in one byte, because the S box is a bijective mapping, the p property will be uh, preserved. Uh, on the other hand, if we only uh, have the b property, the S box is uh, a nonlinear mapping, so we can't say anything about uh, about this uh, byte position after the S box uh, the sub bytes operation. Um, if we are looking at the mixed columns operation. If we have a column that has the p property in one byte position and is constant in the rest, um, then it will have uh, the p property in all byte positions after the mixed column operations. Um, and if we have a column with, uh, the p, uh, uh, with the p property in all positions, it will be balanced after the mixed column operation. So we can now use all these properties to uh, see how such a lambda set evolves in the uh, AES. So this is a, a, a depiction of that. Uh, in opposition to the normal, uh, normal way of doing it, we are actually doing a chosen ciphertext attack. So we start with a lambda set in the fourth round, and then we move to the front of the cipher. So uh, you, can, uh, you can all use the rules that I just showed to uh, check that this is true. But the interesting fact is that we, after the sub-bytes operation, we'll end up with a set of text that is balanced in each byte position. Now, in the standard square attack, what you would do is you would guess a key byte, let's say for the first byte position, go back, th go through the uh, uh, add round key operation and the S box, uh, the sub bytes operation, and check whether the sets of ciphertext is balanced. And you can use this to filter out the wrong uh, key candidates and uh, retrieve the normal round key. But of course, in our setting, this doesn't work because we don't know the S box, so we can't, we can't go through the uh, sub bytes operation. So, what can we do? We can look into the literature and see that there's been this great attack, the success attack, on a very general structure. And we can use the same technique they are using there for, to start the attack um, using the following observation. So if we have a balanced set uh, after the sub bytes operation, this corresponds to a linear uh, equation in the variables of the S-box. So by creating many uh, uh, balanced sets, we can hope to uh, generate enough linear equations to actually be able to deduce, uh, uh, deduce the S-box. But we encounter a problem here because uh, balancedness is uh, um, invariant under affine equivalence. So we end up uh, with two to the 72 S-box candidates. So this is, uh, this is quite a lot to test still. Um, maybe we can use some other uh, techniques of the SAS attack. Uh, this is uh, unfortunately not the case because the SAS attack uh, is a, a decryption uh, attack. So they don't want to recover the key on the S-box. But this is what we want to do here. So uh, we have to find something for ourselves. So what do we do with the S-box now? <clears throat> well, there's a property that we didn't use yet. That is, we didn't use the um, P property. And we know that after the mixed columns operation, um, uh, such a lambda set will uh, have to uh, have the P property in every byte position. So the idea is now to filter out wrong S-box candidate by checking for the P property after the mixed columns operation. So how would such an attack work? Um, first, we use the technique from the success attack to find one of the 2 to the 72 S-box candidates, let's say, in the first byte. We can then use the knowledge of this S-box to derive the remaining key bytes in the other positions, just using the same technique as in the standard square attack. Uh, and now uh, we are able, because of our knowledge of the round, the, the whitening key, and of uh, using this S, uh, this uh, S box that we chose, we can move back our text and find the intermediate text after the shift rows uh, operation. Of course, those will, will only be affinely equivalent to the proper text. Now, by applying affine transformations uh, to these texts and moving them to the mixed column operation, we can check whether we have an affine transformation that leaves the uh, p gives us the p property after the mixed column operation. 
Now this will give us, if we filter out the S-box candidates, we will have two to the 16 remaining candidates. So why is this? This is because uh, the mixed column operation commutes with affine uh, transformations over the Rheindahl field. So as I wrote here, if you, uh, if you multiply, if you have a vector of bytes and you uh, affinely transform uh, each byte and then multiply it with a mixed column operation, a mixed column matrix, this is the same as, uh, as transforming it after the multiplication with the mixed column um, matrix. So we're only able to find up, uh, two to the 16, uh, up to two to the 16 candidates. Uh, clearly, if we have two to the 16 candidates using other properties of the cipher, it's straightforward to find the correct one. The good part about this is when we try to, ch when we check the two to the 72 candidates, we can actually reduce our set uh, um, modular affine equivalence over the Rheindahl field to reduce it to two to the 56 S boxes that we need to check. So why does it work, um, this filtering out? Because general affine transformation, so that is an affine transformation uh, that is not also an affine transformation over the Rheindahl field, so just an uh, affine transformation over the vector space, they do not commute with the mixed columns operation. And uh, the reason for this is that, is that multiplication in the Rheindahl field does not, in general, commute with uh, linear uh, mappings in the vector space. So this, uh, can we prove this? As I wrote here, yes, we can. So I have a very, very short proof here. For those of you who don't like proofs at all, bear with me. This is just one slide, and it's straightforward. So um, we need a little notation. If we have an element A of the Rheindahl field, we don't denote by LA the linear mapping of the ve in the vector space that corresponds to multiplication with this element. So the statement that we can prove now is if we have a um, generator of the Rheindahl field and a linear mapping over the vector space that commutes with multiplication with this uh, generator, then this, uh, this uh, linear mapping must correspond to multiplication with an uh, element of the field. So for the proof, we choose just any element of the field. Then uh, because g, uh, g is a generator, we can denote it as a power of uh, g and we can likewise uh, de denote LC as a power of LG. By induction, then it follows that B must also commute with LC. So the B matrix uh, must commute with uh, multiplication of all elements of uh, the Rheindahl field. Now, by uh, defining that uh, lowercase b is the image of 1 multiplied with b, the matrix b, um, we can have this sequence of equations here. You can follow this for yourself. I'm not going to read it out. Um, we can show that the B matrix must correspond to the uh, multiplication with the element B. So what we showed now is that if a matrix commutes uh, with uh, linear mappings, with, with multiplication in the Rheindahl field, it must be a multiplication in the Rheindahl field. So this is the reason why we can filter out these, uh, the S-boxes. But of course, we still have to test two to the 56 candidates. This is uh, still considerable. So let us check whether there are any tricks that we can use to reduce the workload. So there's one trick that we used. Uh, we used the R property. So the R property is a weaker property than the P property. We say that a set of bytes exhibits the R property if in each bit position uh, uh, the, the values 1 and 0 appear uh, an equal number of times. So the R property uh, lies in between the P property and the B property. Uh, now by using this property, we can actually check bit, bits by them uh, in bit, uh, just in single bit position instead of the whole byte. So this means um, we need to look at a different uh, mixed columns matrix. So this is the mixed column matrix as denoted normally. It's a 4 by 4 matrix uh, with elements of the Rheindahl field. But of course, as said before, we can substitute the, the um, elements of the Rheindahl field with their uh, multiplicative matrices. So this is written down here. And if we now substitute the uh, corresponding elements in the matrix, uh, we can get a 32 by 32 binary matrix that corresponds to the mixed column matrix. If we do that and look at the first row, we get the, uh, the upper row there, and we see that uh, it only uses the uh, uh, first two bit positions of the bytes. This means when we multiply this, uh, the mixed column matrix uh, um, uh, with, a, uh, with a matrix that corresponds to affine transformations in each byte position, and by denoting the rows of the affine transformation A as A0, A1, and so forth, we can write the first row of the, main, uh, of the matrix uh, M as a linear combination of the uh, two first two rows of the affine transformation. Now this means we only need to check two rows. We only need two rows of the affine transformation to check whether the R property is fulfilled in the first bit position. Um, additionally, because we can reduce our whole, 
affine mapping uh, modulo affine equivalence over the Rheindahl field, we can fix one of the two uh, rows. So we only actually have to check one of the rows. This means that the complete workload is reduced from two to the checking two to the 56 to two to the eight. Uh, I mean, seven times, of course, to derive the whole uh, affine mapping. And uh, there's one interesting aspect of this whole thing is if we had chosen initially to do a, a chosen plain text attack instead of a chosen ciphertext attack, we would have been forced now to work with the inverse mixed column matrix, which has a different structure and makes the uh, attack uh, less effective. In fact, uh, in, the, in the similar setting, we would be able to, f uh, to uh, use uh, in every row of the mixed column matrix, there are, would be, it would depend on four rows of the FI mapping. So it would increase the uh, complexity of the step by two to the 16. Um, I should also mention that we, when we used the R property to filter out the S-box candidate, it always worked just as good as the P property. So uh, to summarize here is the, are the complexities of the attack. Uh, in the first row, uh, we give the, uh, complexity, uh, the complexities for the Sasas attack, which uh, attacks uh, three rounds of AES. The comparison is, of course, unfair because the Sasas attack attacks a much more general structure. Um, but we, uh, why this is still interesting to compare uh, is because uh, we can see how much, uh, how much more efficient the attacks can be when we take the additional knowledge into consideration. For the rest, we always compared our attacks with a standard square attack on the normal AES, 128. So you can see for the four and five round versions that there is a, a fairly little, a fairly small gap or almost not, no gap between the two attacks and only for the six round version it increases. Um, and this is of course very interesting because in, uh, using a secret S-box for the four and five round version doesn't, uh, it doesn't help us at all. Um, oh yeah, for the uh, implementation, we implemented the attack on four rounds and it always runs in less than a second, uh, um, including uh, reading in the data, which is the, the major bottleneck there. Um, to conclude, um, when using a secret S-box, uh, the gain in security for at least up to six rounds is, is very little and doesn't, uh, doesn't help a lot. Um, we also were able to show that using this R property instead of the P property, can, uh, can reduce the complexity of the tech uh, considerably. And uh, as to my knowledge, this is the first time that it has been used. And uh, yes, and this is a good example also of um, where the attack depends a lot on the direction of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the attack. So I mean, AES is known for being a very, have a very symmetric structure in regards to uh, decryption and encryption uh, direction. But this is an example where it really depends. So of course, uh, open uh, problems are what happens if we substitute uh, all S-boxes, so the, if all positions where an S-box appears with independent secret S-boxes. This moves the whole setting closer to the success attack, and it would be quite interesting to see how the, uh, this increases the complexities of the attacks. And of course, also, we don't know how the security of AES with a secret S-box is after more than six rounds. So uh, the uh, square attack uh, seems to hit a wall uh, for six rounds, Maybe, maybe there are other uh, ways of attacking more, uh, more rounds. Okay, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Yeah, I guess I, it depends on the, I mean, you get it, the FN equivalent from one side of the S-box. Yeah, and then you get it, if you do the attack from the other direction, you get this FN on the other, on the other side. Yeah, I guess, I guess that might work actually to uh, combine. To compare, compare those two. Yeah, I think that would work. <laughs> I mean, it sounds reasonable, giving my reduced IQ up on stage here. Uh, yeah, but I mean, of course, it would change the attack setting to a chosen plaintext, chosen ciphertext. There is no other question, so we thank you, Mr. Speaker, again.